All right, so it is now time to make our final character for our workshop week. We have quite the motley crew aboard this ship already. Between Tiny, Doc Salem, and Gengilly, Vinheim. As our captain, our surgeon, and our quartermaster, respectively. It's now time to make our fourth character. And yes, there are six positions aboard this ship that are officers. And you know what you can do? You can take these four, and you can generate the last two that we don't. Cake Boss has a question. I'm on the last little bit of writing for my diesel punk project, but I need to make some NPCs of varying importance. Any suggestions? Um, that's so th that's kind of broad, Cake Boss. Uh, something that I could suggest would be to help narrow down, you know, an, an NPC serves a particular function in the context of a story. They usually do one thing and they do that thing very well. And, and it's fine having a two dimensional, like a flat character. That's an important NPC. Uh, if you want to flesh them out even further, you certainly can, but not everyone has to be, you know, a, a fully 3d character. Um, so are, are you looking for mechanical suggestions? Are you looking for... Um, I, I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're searching for, Cake Boss. Uh, Tackler says, I do have one question. I have a player trying to make a power assassin by multiclassing Rogue Assassin and Gloomstalker Ranger. We are curious about multi-attack and surprise. If an opponent is surprised for the first hit of a multi-attack, are they surprised as well for the second hit? <laughs> Uh, well, so surprise in fifth edition tackler. Uh, remember that surprise uh, is—it's not like a surprise round. Uh, if someone's going to initiate combat, um, and they would have a uh, you, you give the surprised condition to the person who would be surprised. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so here, let me... Unfortunately, if I scroll down, it's, it's one page at a time. A band of adventurers sneaks up on a bandit camp, uh, springing from the trees to attack them. A gelatinous cube glides down a dungeon passage, unnoticed by the adventurers until a cube engulfs one of them. In these situations, one side of the battle gains surprise over the other. The DM determines who might be surprised. If neither side tries to be stealthy, they automatically notice each other. Otherwise, the DM compares the dexterity stealth checks of anyone hiding with the passive perception score of each creature on the opposing side. Or if you just arbitrarily rule it, that's fine. Any creature or monster that doesn't notice a threat is surprised at the start of the encounter. If you're surprised, you can't move or take an action on your first turn of the combat, and you can't take a reaction until that turn ends. A member of a group can be surprised even if the other members aren't. And, and so that's why in 5th edition, you roll initiative at the point of surprise, because then everyone else acts sort of on round two, because round one is kind of the surprised round, but surprised is sort of uh, a condition of, of someone, because not everyone may be surprised on that first round, uh, if that makes sense. It's, it's a, the same thing, but different in some regards to other past iterations of being surprised. And because it lasts for the round, if someone multi-attacks on their round, then there you go. It, it's the it's the the whole kit and caboodle. Right? Because you can't take a reaction until the turn ends. Um 
that would indicate that for the entire round, you are surprised. I hope that helps. In the current case, I need a handful of throwaway characters. Well, if they're just throwaway characters, then um, if you want to do some quick... I, I, if, if nothing necessarily matters about them, Cake Boss, you can find uh, the old version of the character generator on our Discord. In our table talk, our, our general chat section as a pinned message. You can also find our NPC worksheet in our uh, in our section that has past content in it uh it's called stream content you'll find it at the top and just look for when we make npcs or villains there's a worksheet you can download and you can go through the steps to create npcs that way too <laughs> Was I able to help answer your question, Tackler? Speaking of uh, generating a character, here's our here's our new and improved character generator. Uh, let's open up our dice roller and get to rolling. Let's find out if we have a female character, a male character, or a multi-class character. We have a female character, and now I'm going to make a 35-sided die, and I'm going to roll that because that is our race options if we open up all races. Boop -a -doo, and here we go. We have a female 18. A female half-orc. So that's uh, that's player's handbook. And something that I do, it's not necessarily a sub-race, but as you can see, there's a distinction between uh, do they favor their human descent or favor their orcish descent. And that that's a tiebreaker, right? If, if we're trying to develop this character's personality or their look, uh, do they look more orcish? Do they look more human? Do they act more orcish? Do they act more human? And so I'm going to roll a d10, and we're going to just go odds or evens. Odds. So she's going to favor her human descent. Favors human. All right. Once more, we're going to use the balanced odds and find out what her alignment will be. 53. She is true neutral. And we are going to be generating her at level... We rolled an 83. Level 17. So she is true neutral in level 17. That's going to mean that we get ability score improvements at 4, 8, 12, and 16. Let's find out uh, if we're going to take any of those as feats. Nope, it's all going to be ASIs. Oh, natural. In fact, i got to check something real quick here. You know what? On our last character, uh, shame on me for missing this, um, rogues get uh, some extra ability score improvements, and so we actually owe her... Uh, we actually owe her two more points in something at 10th level here. So shame on me for missing that, uh, but uh, if, if you all can help remind me that our captain actually gets two more points in something... I would appreciate it. 
probably pop that in dex or or we could do a strength and something else. Anyway, let's go back to our current character. I say that as I'm making a note here. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Our background, we only have one background left, and that is the smuggler. And so, the smuggler background in the Ghost of Saltmarsh has D6 sort of origin options, which means we're going to roll 2D8 for her personality traits, and then 4D6, so we get her smuggler type, her ideal, bond, and flaw. Head back to the dice roller. 2d8. 6 and 1. 4d6. 6, 6, 1, 4. Six, six, one, four. And then we had a 6 and a 1 for the personality traits. There we go. You got to get out of here. All right, Cake Boss. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, Tackler, I'm glad we're able to help you out. Yep, the... If he's going out of his way to try something and, and you and you as the DM are already aware of it and can account for it, have fun. Play to have fun. And thanks for running that bias here, uh, Tackler. Uh, you know, these sort of thinking experiments are excellent because they'll, they'll help us either open our minds to something maybe we haven't thought of, or it'll help us to solidify our knowledge of the rules as written but it doesn't mean that those are the rules that we play by. All right, now we've we already have our background. Now it's time to determine our class and our subclass. And for that, we're going to get the help of our big golden D12. You ready? 8. A ranger there are five different rangers. Well, subclasses of ranger, I should say. I'm going to make a five-sided die, and we're going to find out which kind of ranger that we will be producing. Number two. And that is a gloomstalker. There you go, Tackler. You got your wish. Pardon me. <clears throat> the dice have favored you, Tackler. Now, Rangers are going to get uh, a favored enemy as well as a uh, fighting style. And so we'll keep this open when we get to that point. Uh, because we're, we will randomly roll for the favored enemies of this ranger. And now let's come down here and find our half-orc so that we can flesh her out with some physical stats. There we go. There's our half-orc. You see how, the, how everything changes here? Uh, she is also a young adult. And, and this is, uh, again, with, with this new setup as compared to the old one, the old uh, one that you'll see, that one is more the cultural adulthood. What we're playing around with here in uh, with this one is more of the physical range. So, for example, we have a young adult half-orc. And she's, uh, we're going to have 9 plus 1d5 years. So she is 13 years old. Now you'll notice, half-orcs 
don't live all that long. And so that's why she's a young adult. Most half-orcs live naturally to maybe 60. And many, uh, many of them might die earlier uh, from different life circumstances. So they're not a long-lived race. Now, her height starts at 4'10". Um, honestly, if she's, if she's uh, this, if she's that old, we may not want to give her too much more of a height modifier. Now, her orcish blood, she does favor her human side. That could be genetic, uh, like with her, her presentation. Maybe she doesn't have prominent tusks or uh, her, her, whatever her skin pigmentation on her human side is more prevalent than uh, a green or a gray of an orc. We probably don't want to give her the full 2d10 height modifier. Uh, instead, I think we could just uh, downgrade this to something like 2d4 and use that instead. And we got maximum. So uh, she, she hit a growth spurt, everyone. Uh, our young adult here is uh, five foot six. And we're going to take that same eight. And normally, again, it'd be uh, this is the adult modifier here. We could probably get away with just having this and make it a 1d6. Four. So she's 172 pounds. So she is uh, she has not missed. Uh, she's not missed PE. But then again, she's a hunter. She probably swims. Probably, you know, eats a lot of good caloric intake to hunt and swim and uh, and to do all the things that she is needing to do. And if we wanted to and just use the base weight and instead just make it, you know, base weight plus that. So she's 148 or whatever. Really, that's up to you. And and the reason why I include this as an option is because I want you to think about the age of your character. If we have a character sheet where all the stats are the same, all the class abilities are the same, um, you know, if they cast spells, all the spells are the same, and that character is 60 years old, and suddenly we take that same character sheet and that character is 16 years old, despite the character mechanically being the same, it is not the same character at all whether they're level 1 or level 10 or level 20. And I would challenge you all out there, if you've never played a young adventurer, you know, so I'm talking, you know, I'm talking you're going out on your first Pokemon adventure, you know, you're, you're leaving Pallet Town, you know, at a, a tender young age to go explore the world. I mean, hopefully it's not going to be a dark and deadly campaign, um, but, you know, if everyone's comfortable at the table, then, you know, guess it is what it is even uh even ash had to see uh giovanni's uh what nido queen get destroyed um <clears throat> now that might that might have been a different pokemon or if you've never played an elderly character maybe one that honestly this is this is her her or his last adventure even if she lives through it there's not that many years left for this character have fun with the age Step outside of your comfort zone. A, a lot of us might say, well, I'm a guy, and so I want to play a girl, and that's a roleplay challenge, and it can be. Uh, that's a common first step for people to step outside of themselves and to try thinking in a different way. And then, of course, I mean, we're human beings. At least I imagine most of us are. And so we'll, we'll take on something else like a, uh, uh, you know, we'll play an orc or a tiefling or a dragonborn or something that's fantastic and definitely not human because we're human. We know what it's like. I would also then say challenge yourself for a character's age. Well, oh, sheeps, uh, yeah, you are a farm animal. An earthy farm animal at that, if I recall correctly. All right, so anyway, our, our little role play pep talk. 
about not always playing the physically, you know, I'm between uh, my my race is 20 and 30 year, uh, years old uh, in perfect uh, in perfect health character. <laughs> uh, your father plays a half elf druid and his character is older. And because his background was living alone in the forest for 100 years, he's playing his uh, guy as happy go lucky, hitting pubs and being very aloof. Oh, because it, he can finally he can finally socialize, and so he's just living it up. That that's great, tackler. All right, so we have we have this information. We'll come back and revisit this in just a little bit. Let's go to our Ghost of Saltmarsh book, and let's let's find out more about our character. Who is she? What does she do? And why does she do it? Uh, as a smuggler, we get proficiency in athletics and deception. We have tool proficiencies with water vehicles. Equipment. A fancy leather vest or a pair of leather boots. A set of common clothes. And a leather pouch, or like a belt pouch, with 15 gold. Fancy vest, common clothes, belt pouch with 15 gold. Our feature is called Down Low. You are acquainted with a network of smugglers who are willing to help you out of tight situations. While in a particular town, city, or other similarly sized community, DM's discretion, you and your companions can stay for free in safe houses. Safe houses provide a poor lifestyle. While staying at a safe house, you can choose to keep your presence and that of your companions a secret. Shh. Secret. Now, our claim to fame as we rolled it was number six. And so for, for our little smuggler here... What did she do? Uh, playing both sides. You once smuggled crates of crossbow bolts and bundles of arrows, each destined for an opposing side in a regional war. At the uh, um, a regional war at the same time, the buyers arrived within moments of each other, but did not discover your trickery. So she might be smug. If, if, if any of you feel inspired to draw her, she probably has a smug anime face. There's plenty of references you can find on those about those online. All right, now her personality. Her personality traits are six and one. Six reads... I enjoy doing things others believe to be impossible. And number one states, I love being on the water, but hate fishing. That uh, So that could end up uh, showing that she doesn't have patience. Or perhaps she is, um, uh, she might be even scared of fish. Or she finds them just to be distasteful or gross. Or professionally, uh, if I get fish on me, then, you know, I'll have a smell or a slime about me. And that could, that could give away where I've been. I, there's a lot we can work with, with, uh, these two personality traits. She's very smug, <laughs> says O'Sheeps. Our smuggler ideal is number six. We are daring. I am most happy when risking everything. So she is so she's she's definitely smug. And she's a little firecracker, isn't she? She's willing to put it all on the line. Her bond is number one. My wessel. I don't know if any of you caught that I spelled it with a W. Anyway. My vessel was stolen from me, 
And I burn with the desire to recover it. Now, I wonder if we're trying to build links within the party. Who else might come to mind? Actually, two people can come to mind. One could be our captain, who may very well have won this vessel from someone else, because our captain is also young. And so between our uh, between our prodigy our prodigy shipwright at 15, and well, we haven't rolled yet what our, our role is on here. Th this could be something that she understands. And maybe acquiring the current ship that the captain has is a part of getting this back. And don't forget that Tiny over here, who is our Loxodon, um, I lost something important in the deep sea, and I intend to find it. What if Tiny and this character were on the same ship that sunk before, and both of them want that ship back? at any cost. In fact, if that's the case, uh, Tiny, as this fighter, uh, fighters and uh, fighters and uh, rangers share uh, some similarities here. Uh, Tiny might even be kind of a, a matronly figure. Now, I'm not talking like an austere, proper, motherly figure. Because Tiny here burps, farts, and cusses with the best of them. Uh, she, she is a very earthy individual. Um, and, and so that in some way could, uh, you know, could have come across to this, uh, to this young lady, this young ranger. However, with her disposition for being neutral, she might see the excesses, uh, or the, you know, the kind of lifestyle that her Loxodon leads and instead is trying to, to be level, right? As a smuggler, sometimes you have to deal with people you don't want to have to deal with. And so she's learning patience. And, uh, and so she's getting some lessons and life lessons, but she's trying her best, even at this age, when the world is confusing and you fight the fact that you, you know everything, but you don't, but you do, but you don't. So she's uh, she's been put in a very interesting position. And lastly, her flaw... Her flaw is number four. I struggle to trust the words of others. Ah. Now she is a she is a an officer. And so she might trust the word of other officers. Or at least uh, take him with a grain of salt. But she probably isn't going to be the best at working with uh with just any passenger or, you know, a crew member who hasn't been around for a year or more. Um, or However, you would want to manifest this if she was your character here. But she struggles to trust the word of others. So something happened in her life to plant this seed of doubt. And what could that event have been? What led this girl who is, who is coming into her womanhood? Who is who lost something valuable. You know, it says vessel. It doesn't necessarily have to be a ship. It could it could also be an important item or even an important person. Because again, we're using this as a prompt. Let's think about this creatively in ways that builds a world and builds a story and builds bonds. But even if it's a vessel, in her own way, I don't know, could this have been her parents were aboard that ship and they went down with the ship? Could it be uh, something sentimental that occurred? Uh, she, you know, she met her first significant other. Uh, as she's just, you know, starting to to try and live life as uh, as a, a normal person. D you know, despite maybe her heritage could be controversial, uh, being biracial, um, or. What has led her down the path to be this gloom stalker? You know, this ranger, that this person who can attack swiftly and savagely.
Her vessel was stolen from her. Hey, Captain, let me borrow this boat and never brought it back. It could even be something as simple as that tackler. Oh, that cool, Bubonic. Uh, thank you for uh, that nautical inspiration. All right, so we have our we have our background uh, points. Now I'm going to roll a D3, and we're gonna find out which officer role she is gonna be filling on this boat full of misfits. And you know what? I think we have another misfit on our hands. This is a group of people who I think society will never expect to achieve anything. And yet, here they are. And I wonder what they'll be capable of doing if they work together. D3. First mate. Bozen. Cook. She is our first mate, which could uh, which could mean a stronger bond with the captain since they're both about the same age. So where did these two come from in that case? And this is going to create a very interesting character. The first mate is the morale officer. And so she might not necessarily have a problem projecting words and trust, uh, or at least, you know, trustability to others, but she might find she has self-doubt about the words of others coming back to her. She might do her job and provide morale, but she might not believe people are actually listening to her, and probably maybe because of her age or whatever circumstances led her down the path that she's walked. So let's take a look at what first mates are suggested to have in Salt Marsh. The vessel could be a very expensive model, gold and jewels, maybe a clock too, which she took in for repairs or cleaning and it was stolen. Ah, okay. So, it, I mean, I, I don't want to say a toy necessarily, but it was, it was not a real, it wasn't a sailing ship, it was a model ship. Good advice, Bubonic. Oh, Sheeps, you, you like the fact that we have these two, uh, we have these two kind of misfit kids who are stepping up and confronting life because they've been through some hardships? Or at least presumed hardships. All right, now, a first mate. Oh, that's not the right page. I uh, went too far, I think. I should just look it up. There we go. Back to the appendix, everyone. Go, 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 go. Here we go. Our first mate. This specialist keeps the crew's morale high by providing supervision, encouragement, and discipline. A first mate benefits from a high charisma score, as well as proficiency with the intimidation and persuasion skills. So charisma is going to need to be high for her, and we're going to give her intimidation and persuasion as well. All right. Now... We go to Half Orc. And what does she get mechanics wise by virtue of being a Half Orc? Uh, her strength score increases by two, and her con increases by one. She is a medium sized creature with a speed of 30 run, 15 climb, 15 swim, 0 fly. She has dark vision out to 60 feet. She has... Uh, ah, here we go. So this is where we have a double up. Uh, because of menacing, you gain proficiency in the intimidation skill. And so, again, this is a point where you can ask your DM, Hey, would you upgrade this to expertise because I have it doubled up? Or instead of intimidation, 
uh, through either first officer or my racial ability, could I take another skill instead? Um, or negotiate something else. Um, so what we can say in this case, she's extra good at intimidating. Can you imagine this smug, sassy girl coming up to you and, and putting you back in your place aboard a ship? Relentless Endurance. When you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can drop to one hit point instead. Uh, she is tough. Uh, she will... Uh, I mean, this is probably why she has the, the begrudging respect of everyone on board. You know, when you first see her, you're like, oh, whatever. Uh, well, actually, because of her size, right? She's, she's a big girl for her age. You know, people might mistake her for being older than she is. But when people learn, oh, she's 13, oh, whatever. And then meanwhile... You know, she uh, she ends up taking, like, a, a sword swing from a, an, an invading pirate doing a boarding action. And she just, like, holds onto the sword with her hand and pulls in the person close and, uh, and roars in their face. Uh, suddenly, the other sailors aboard get a newfound respect uh, that she is not just a 13-year-old girl. We also get Savage Attacks, uh, which improve our critical hits. Our languages are going to be Common and Orcish. And there we go. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right, now we go to Ranger. And we're going to build our Ranger first, and then we'll add Gloomstalker, which I think is in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. But we're going to build our 17 levels of Ranger first, and then we'll tack on our subclass. I want to stay up longer, but I'm utterly wiped out for the day and, pos and possibly eternity, so I'm going to go to bed. All right, oh sheeps, rest well, and hello, Fallon. Your book had its appendix out? <laughs> She is beefy. Oh, Gloomstalker Xanathars, thank you for that tackler. Okay. I'll make sure to pop open that book here in a second. All right, so we are 17 levels of Ranger. Bada boom. This is what we're looking at. Our proficiency bonus is a plus six. Uh, let's see. We're going to get some spell slots here. Four, three, 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 one. Here we go. No cantrips. And we'll go to our spells known in a little bit. Spells are one of the last things that we add onto a character. As a ranger, we're a D10 hit die class, so we get 17 of those as we are level 17, coincidentally. Our armor proficiency is light, medium and shields we are proficient with simple and martial weapons this seems like all the more reason why tiny could be uh, a quasi maternal figure for her uh let's see uh no tool proficiencies strength and dex are our saving throws again this is building a good bond between her and tiny and now we can choose three skills from Animal Handling, Athletics, Insight, Investigation, Nature, Perception, Stealth, and Survival. I enjoy doing things others believe to be impossible. I love being on the water, but I hate fishing. Uh, daring, I'm most happy when risking everything. My vessel was stolen from me and I burn with the desire to recover it. I struggle to trust the words of others. I'm picking up Insight, Stealth, let's see, oh, another peal of thunder there, Insight, Stealth, and Investigation might help her get her ship back, hmm. Let's see, she also played both sides in a uh, in an arms deal.
Yeah, I think investigation could help with that as well, like managing your time, your time ta your timetables and whatnot. Now, if you have other options, let me know. But I think insight, investigation, and stealth are going to be the way forward for her. You think survival from li uh, living on the open sea? Oh, perhaps. Uh, I mean, if she was fed, right? If she didn't have to be the one surviving and she was given her meals because it wasn't her role to provide, she may not necessarily need survival. I see what you're saying, though, uh, Tackler. And if, if we do go survival, which skill would you want to swap it for? Of course... Ah, oh, you know what, Tackler? You bring up something interesting. The other option was instead of having expertise in a redundancy of intimidation, instead, why don't we take another skill instead? And now we're, now everyone's happy. Does that work for you? Alexander, good morning to you. It has been a while since I've seen you. I hope you're well. It's always a pleasure to have you here, Alexander. We are making uh, some ship's officers. Scale mail or leather armor? Hmm. You know, I actually think uh, like charisma is going to be important because uh, uh, we'll we'll honor we'll honor the. She gets the bonus stuff if we favor that uh, that uh, ability. I, I want to say she's very physical here. Like, strength and dex could both be really high. The leader of landing party, so survival would help her find food. Hey, that could work out too. So I think with if strength is going to be big, she'll be able to wear scale mail. Two short swords or two simple melee weapons. Um, oh well, you know what? Uh, she will get a fighting style. Uh, tell you what, let's go. F let's find out which uh, fighting style she's going to have. We're going to roll one d four and randomly select it. Right for a ranger, archery, defense, dueling, or two weapon fighting. We rolled two, defense. So she, she's going to be very defensive. And that could also be a bit of symbolism for her as a character, too. Uh, so if she's wearing armor, she gets one more armor class to whatever armor she's wearing. All right, so that doesn't necessarily indicate that we need like two weapons. I mean, you can you can two weapon fight from level one and not have two weapon fighting. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So, let's see, or two simple melee weapons. I don't know. I don't know if anyone else. The captain can fight with a uh, a short sword as well. So maybe if there's a bond between the captain and her, uh, that she could have two short swords. A Dungeoneer's pack or an explorer's pack. Although if, she, if she's the type, if she's a smuggler and she needs to climb and do other things like that, I think the Dungeoneer's pack is going to be more appropriate for her. And then a longbow and a quiver with 20 arrows we are going to get favored enemy uh let's see so we get that additional enemy at 6 and 14 so we are going to have three favored enemies let's go back to our, our roller here there are 14 broad categories of enemies. And so I'm going to roll a 14-sided die three times, and we're going to find out which enemies are her favored. 13, 2, and 11. Hmm. 
Uh, so we have... Oh, two humanoid races. Beasts and oozes. Now, I wonder which humanoid races that she would, uh, that she would, uh, stalk. Hey, Mr. Wolfie, welcome. Oh, you know what we can do? Ha <laughs> ha. Let's go back to our races and let's roll a 35-sided die twice. And we can determine the two humanoids, um, the two humanoids that she would, uh, that she would, uh, hunt. Uh, she is true neutral, Bubonic. 20 and 18. Hobgoblins and... And half-orcs. Uh-oh. Hobgoblins and half-orcs. And she's a half-orc herself. What happened, everyone? Things are going really well, Wolfie. We're having a ton of fun with this uh, exercise. Yeah, she doesn't like her own kind. All right, so what that will do uh, from the favored enemy here, uh, oozes and beasts don't have their own languages. I mean, you might be able to argue with your... your de I, mean, I don't say argue, like actually argue. You might be able to bring up... You know, the oozes don't have a language... But you might be able to mimic their sounds to maybe do some basic interaction, such as trying to attract them or try to sound like a, a mating call or a predatory warning. So it's not a language, but you might be able to convey basic, uh, basic things with creatures that don't have that lang that don't have a language. And I would suggest you bring that up because I think I think there are many people who might otherwise choose something like an ooze, but they feel like they're missing out because they don't get a language from it, which is understandable. And this is a good happy medium. So it's not like it's not giving you the ability to talk to animals, but you might be able to understand if you hear a moose cry, uh, you, you get the idea, oh, all right, so that moose is uh, upset, like it sounds like there's danger. It, it empowers the character still. It doesn't give away anything, per se. And it still makes sense for someone who has uh, developed uh, a particular fondness of tracking down or interacting with these enemies. Now, uh, she can already speak Orcish, so this is going to uh, allow her to speak Goblin. And, of course, Favorite Enemy gives us all kinds of, uh, all kinds of fun stuff against our enemies. Now, as a natural explorer, uh, we are going to get uh, favored ter uh, terrain types. We're going to get three of them. And I'm going to roll a D8 three times. All right? To determine the three territories that she is extra good at stalking through or through which she's good at stalking. Three D eight, four, one, five, four, one, five forests, Arctic and grassland.
Coast doesn't have to be automatic. She may not she might not have lived on the on the sea before. Um, or if you live at sea, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are particularly good at uh, you're particularly good at interacting with the creatures there, especially bubonic one. She loves being on the water, but she hates fishing. And exactly, you can interpret stuff. Forest can mean jungle. Or, you know, technically bamboo is a grass, but your DM might say that uh, you are in a bamboo forest instead of grassland. Um, she, uh, she might not uh, like fishing, but uh, she, what if she is in a kelp forest underwater? Would a kelp forest be, uh, you know, count as a forest? Or if she's in cold water, could that count as arctic? Hey, Marcus, uh, so can I boop them on the head with a warhammer? Can you boop uh, what on the head with a warhammer? Zulerpai, uh, can you train an ooze to be a guard ooze, maybe with a spell and sick your ooze on enemies? Yeah, if you work with your DM, you could find a way to do something like that. And yeah, I, I think it works out, Bubonic. And so when we stop and ask ourselves, well, oh, wouldn't Coastal be an be an auto include? Doesn't have to. She might not have lived on the coast. She could have gone from you know interior, uh, just took a boat ride down to a portside city, never hunted or understood the beach or the coastline or or the tides, and then took a ship out to sea, and that's when her life began, kind of a thing. And by the way, something like oozes. If we're talking a nautical campaign, you could probably have some pretty, like, cool-looking, like, man of war uh, jellyfish, like, dire jellyfish and stuff that could count as oozes. And, and she could go hunting those things. That would be a lot of fun. A, oh, my gosh, a 24-hour D&D session? Marcus, you are, in fact, a beast. Yeah, if you want to share any of those stories, you're welcome to do so. All right, so that's Favored Enemy and Natural Explorer. We have our fighting style. Uh, we're going to worry about spell casting later. Spells are one of the last things that we worry about. Our archetype, we're going to get to Gloomstalker in just a little bit. We are also going to get Primeval Awareness. You focus uh, your awareness on a region around you for a minute per level of spell slot you expend. You can sense whether the following types of creatures are present. Uh, uh, aberrations, Celestials, Dragons, Elementals, Fey, Fiends, and Undead. This feature doesn't reveal the creature's location or number. She can act as a bit of a, a radar on a boat, if you think about it. She can go up to the crow's nest and... Um, bing! 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 Con, this is Sonar. We're being actively pinged. Ping! At 5th level, we're going to get extra attack. At 8th level, we're going to get lands stride. We can move through uh, non-magical difficult terrain with no extra movement. Uh, we can also hide in plain sight. Fourteenth level, we can vanish. You can take the hide action as a bonus action on your turn. And you can't be tracked by non-magical means unless you choose to leave a trail. And we're just shy of our feral senses. Almost there, but not quite. Now, we need to pop open Xanathar's Guide to Everything... And discover what being a Gloomstalker gives this character. Uh, let's see. For a Ranger, Gloomstalker's on 41.
All right, starting at third level, you learn an additional spell when you reach certain levels in this class, as shown in the Gloomstalker spells table. The spell counts as a ranger spell for you, but doesn't count against the number of ranger spells you know. Uh, so we can fill in some of this stuff here. So we have Disguise Self. Uh, Gloom Stalker. Rope Trick. Actually, let's see. Our slots were four, three, 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 and one. I think Rope Trick is a uh, uh, second level. Fear. If I'm mistaken on the levels of these spells, let me know. Greater Invisibility and Seeming. All right. We are also going to get Dread Ambusher. At third level, you, uh, you master the art of the ambush. You can give yourself a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your wisdom modifier. At the start of your first turn of each combat, your walking speed increases by 10 feet, which lasts until the end of the turn. If you take the attack action on that turn, you can make one additional weapon attack as part of that action. If the attack hits, the target takes an extra 1d8 damage of the uh, weapon's damage type. We are also going to get Umbral Sight. Uh, gain Dark Vision out to 60 if you already have it. The, it's increased to 90. Now, th there's nothing necessarily wrong with Dark Vision to 90 feet. Comma, however, Dark Vision was simplified in uh, in 5th edition because having characters with multiple lengths of Dark Vision, let alone in prior editions where you had low light vision or Dark Vision, you end up describing the same room three different times. Uh, technically be four times to the four characters who have different levels of dark vision. And so it's up to you as the DM if you would want that. And so in this case, in our party of four, we have someone who has uh, dark vision out to 120 feet. And so she would then have dark vision out to 90 feet. If you would just want to keep it easy and just give her 120 dark vision, that way... You're not having to describe the same thing several times to the effect of everyone is just listening to your description anyway, so... Eh? Um, so it's something to think about. Mechanically, I'm, I'm going to put it at 90 feet as per the rules here, but consider that as a dungeon master. Do you want to really... I mean, how many different levels of dark vision do you want to juggle in a party? Um, let's see. Iron Mind. Gain proficiency in wisdom saving throws. If you already have this proficiency, you instead gain proficiency in intelligence or charisma, your choice. Well, we don't have wisdom, so we'll take wisdom. Uh, we're also going to get Stalker's Flurry. You learn to attack with such unexpected speed, you can turn a miss into another strike. Once on each of your turns, when you miss with a weapon attack, you can make another weapon attack as part of the same action. Stalker's Flurry. And lastly, we're going to get Shadowy Dodge. At 15th level, you can dodge in unforeseen ways with wisps of supernatural shadow around you. Whenever a creature makes an attack roll against you and doesn't have advantage on the roll, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on it. You must use this feature before you know the outcome of the attack roll. Hey, Ozzy, welcome. And I do see that uh, Marcus is sharing a part of his 24-hour marathon story here. Um, actually, going back a little bit, uh, so Zulurpai asked about training in Ooze. Um, mm hmm... Main point of D&D is to have fun, so do whatever. Yep. Exactly, Tackler. 
Uh, this was a weird session, says Marcus. Oh, and hey, Tackler, thank you so much. Oh, that, that was Misfit uh, gifting to Tackler? Oh, well, then, Misfit, thank you also. But, uh, Tackler, I mean, I appreciate your presence and, and you sharing your, uh, your, um, your answers to the questions here. So, Marcus says, this was a weird session. We all fell asleep on a ship in the last session. We all woke up on an island. We rolled what island we woke up on, depending who controls it or if it's dangerous and such. And I, of course, playing Luck, uh, got the male-hating Amazonian island as warriors who's innocent to stuff like that. <laughs> My role sucks, says Marcus. And so your 24-hour session was trying to survive the island? Uh, rope Trick, uh, rope trick uh, is, a sp is an amazing spell. Uh, it's actually a spell that I I do not uh, I do not allow in my own personal campaign. So what I would do in this instance as a as a DM, if the DM uh, taketh, the DM can also giveth, and I would just replace that spell with something else. Yes, a gloom stalker, a eh, misfit. And yeah, we had a duragar, not a drow. Uh, Ozzy says, hey, Maddie, a local game store has appeared around the corner, and they're running Adventures League uh, that I could sign up for online, they said. Any experience with this? Uh, so Adventures League does have some standard rules uh, in how they should be run. Are they going to be run that way? It's really going to be up to the DM. Um, but Ozzy, I, if you can join Adventures League, join it and have fun. Uh, now, just keep in mind Adventures League, is a, it's like an open public game. And you may be playing with uh, newcomers or old timers. And so there could be a mix of experiences and personalities at the table. Um, if, uh, if you have a dungeon master that is stepping up and running that, I would hope that dungeon master is good at ma uh, uh, balancing the, the social engagements of the players, not just the characters, of the players at the table. And also, if you have questions, you should also be able to ask that DM. I would imagine most stores, if not all of them, that run Adventures League uh, will provide you rules and uh, a character sheet and some uh, tips on creating a character as well. You went back and read some great things from Tackler. Oh, so Tackler, there you go. You earned Misfits, uh, you earned Misfits uh, appraisal. And now, Tackler, you, you have access to our, our miniatures, box opening mini, our cat butt, and our, oh my, our, our, our red dragon girl who has a bit of a shocked expression on her face. Things are heating up. So what's going on in the session, Misfit? Also start to be playing in the first session tomorrow morning. Been a couple years since I played in an actual campaign. Time for my Goliath Oath of Conquest Paladin to Gallagher his way through evil hordes. I like the way you describe that, Misfit. How is the community? Could I go there alone? Pardon. Yeah, you should be able to... It, you don't need a group of friends. If you show up, odds are there's going to be other people who are there. And even if you're the only one at the table, sit down with the DM, make a character, and the DM might also be able to modify the adventure uh, for a small party size. Most stores should be friendly. Uh, just, you know, go in there, ask questions politely, and um, and I, I hope you'll have a good experience, Ozzy. Your players had their trap foiled by another trap, and one of the players got kidnapped. Now they are on the hunt for the player and the mole in their midst. Uh-oh, we're getting some intrigue going on. There are mysteries wrapped in enigmas, layers upon layers, and machinations that last lifetimes. I like the cut of your jib, misfit. Uh, Alright, now that we have our... We have our character all but made. All we have left to do is drop in our scores here. Now, in keeping up with what I... Uh, 
what I was talking about when we're uh, assigning officer roles. They're an officer because they're good at the thing that the officer needs to be good at. And so charisma it is. We're going to put our 15 in charisma. Aside from that, I want to say our 14 should go into strength. Um, then... We could probably go 13 dex, 12 wisdom. Ten constitution, and we'll put the eight in intelligence. Uh, she hasn't exactly studied a lot of books. Uh, she's a she, she's a, a girl of passion, um, and uh, and she's following her instincts more than her knowledge. Now it, she's she's good at investigation, and and that's what I, I want to make sure I stress this anytime it comes up. You can have your dump stat be something, but it's okay to have a proficiency in a dump stat. Or in a skill that is feeding off of a dump stat. So she doesn't... She's not intelligent in all things. She's just decent at one thing when it comes to intelligence. So she's not dumb. Having an 8 intelligence doesn't automatically make someone dumb. In this case, she's really good at putting clues together. At building plans. At, uh, you know, at studying things. So that's going to put an 11 in her constitution... And a 16 in her strength. Now we have, uh, let's see, 4, 8, 12, and 16. We have 8 points because we didn't roll any feats to give her to drop into the character. So we could probably go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven, eight. There we go. Uh, they wanted a changeling in their party, uh, so the bad guys have all kinds of shapeshifters. Trust no one. Yep. Uh, oh, so yeah, you, you do that thing, Misfit, where, well, if you want something special, that means it opens up the source for me as well. Uh, changelings, when we instituted them in my fourth ed in my world during fourth edition, it led to an entire part of our campaign that was a trial where the party came up with what was called the changeling defense uh, because you had to come up with a way to prove or disprove or at least not be able to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that someone wasn't a changeling. Your party consists of a tabaxi wild magic sorcerer, half-elf druid of the moon, and a half-elf and a half -elf thief. I've placed a wizard's notebook in Dragon Spear and have given two party members conflicting reasons to collect it. Ooh. I like the idea. You haven't thought of that. Uh, so Jensen, uh, welcome. And uh, what what idea, what idea did you find inspiration in reading? Oh, about a dump stat. Yeah, because uh, look, with investigation, uh, her intelligence modifier might be a minus one, but she gets a plus five to investigation. So she doesn't know a lot about nature. She doesn't know a lot about religion, and that's fine. But when it comes to piecing clues together, she's good at putting the puzzle together. She just can't tell you about the history of the two armies that are depicted fighting. And so uh, you don't always have to have proficiencies in your strong abilities. I would challenge you, just like I've challenged you to make sure that your charisma character isn't your captain. To make sure that all of your characters uh, aren't the same race or general class. To challenge you not to play the healthy late teens to early 30s equivalent character for your race, right? Play play the elderly or play the young. And also I would challenge you, make something, uh, give a proficiency in something that is a low stat for you and still use it. Investigation is crucial for this character. And she doesn't need to know a bunch of all this other stuff in order to be able to put clues together to find her ship and get it back. All right, so this is four, two, one, two, three. Giving us a 10 and a 10. Oh, Jensen, thank you very much for the follow. Uh, I'm happy you found some inspiration and you are welcome to hang out. You can ask questions. 
Uh, you can share stories. You can be a part of the conversation however you'd like. Or if you just want to lurk, you're welcome to lurk. Have a lurk around. <laughs> There we go. Cleric in my game, 17 wisdom, 6 int. He loves having to balance how his character comes to the wisdom and how his character would convey that to other people. Cleric's wisdom can come from the deity. Very nice fallback to knowing how people work in wisdom of nature while not being book smart. You have an elderly gnome wizard that was discredited after an accident when he was teaching. Had his spell books taken away, so he had to start over at an old age. Oh, that that's a cool adventure prompt, Misfit. I like that. I'm DMing for my kid's best friend and his son and my wife. Oh, Jensen. <laughs> Everyone out there, please applaud Jensen for stepping up. In, and I, I love hearing when people are running for their friends, like especially for friends, but also for their family. And if it's teaching the next generation. I'm biased. I own a game store, and I, I teach people D&D for a living. I mean, you, me being here and you being here is, is evidence of this, everyone. But also in, in the physical store. And I'll tell you, despite my bias, you can... There's so much good that can come out of teaching this game to others. Especially kids. When they're learning English skills, math skills, socialization skills, critical thinking skills, reading skills drawing and art skills i mean jensen you can turn a you can turn a D, &D session into a, a a home study session and especially if you know what subjects interest your kid or especially if they're having difficulty in something like if they're having difficulty in math drop a drop a, a math puzzle in there and help them through it and when you do so you're creating mnemonic devices to help them remember how to confront situations, be it math, be it a bully at school, be it uh, other life situations. How can you de-escalate a situation without getting violent? All of this is something that D&D &D can act as a medium for teaching younger kids in a way that doesn't make it seem like a, a lame life lesson. All but your best friend are first-time RPGers. Oh, Jensen, man, nothing's going to beat that feeling. Oh, you're going to get to watch the expressions on their faces, and and I and I hope I hope you have amazing, amazing sessions with them. Working as a closing manager in retail. Oh, yeah, yep. Misfit, I, I hope you can get that. I hope you can get that. I played for 20 years, never DM'd. They love it. They beg to play. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, Jensen. Fallon, you're dying to teach your boyfriend, uh, but he's the sort you have to wait around until his interest has peaked. So, Fallon, I, I mean, if you know what interests him, you can approach, you can approach teaching him the game that way. And, and if you ever want help in, you know, in like, oh, so he really loves sci-fi, but D&D is more fantasy. How can I, how can I convey something sci-fi to him or whatever? Let me know or let, uh, or go to the RPG workshop under the mentor section of our discord and myself and others can help you out with that. Yeah, Misfit, if you want to post the link, that's fine. Thank you for asking. Um, it it would be doable, Fallon. Hey, old not uh, old knock, welcome. Yeah, Ozzy, I I fully agree. You just do GURPS. Ah, thank you, Misfit.
What's annoying, Jensen? Oh, yeah, play by post. Th that'd be kind of the approach to take. All right, now that we have this, our initiative, our initiative is actually going to be a plus four. And the reason for that is because uh, Gloomstalkers get dexterity plus wisdom to their initiative. Our armor class and scale mail is going to be 16. However, because we took the defensive fighting style, it's 17 without a shield. Our passive perception is 12, as that's 10 plus our, our perception modifier. Uh, let's see. Our hit points, we get all 10 at first level. And then for our remaining 16 levels, it's half plus one of our hit die. And then for all 17 of our levels, we get our constitution modifier in bonus hit points. So this is going to become 17. This is going to become 96. Uh, so this is going to be 106. Um, 116 plus 7 is 123. So we have 123 hit points at level 17. Also, we have earned a name. We're no longer a collection of stats. So if if our girl here uh, has inspired any sort of a name, then, um, hey, you can let me know. Short swords, we can attack off of decks because it's a finesse weapon. However, we're probably using strength. So she's swinging a melee strength weapon at a plus 10. However, something dexterity based is going to be at a plus 8, which is still pretty good. If we're casting a spell, spells off of our, our ranger spell list are off of wisdom. So we have also a plus 8. And to save against our spell effects is a 16. As you add 8 to your attack modifier, and that's just the static number that determines that. It is what it is. So spell casting is off of there. We had a 16, and that's a plus 8. We are a ranger. We have no cantrips and to determine our spells da -da -da -da, see here spells known we know two spells at level two so level two and level two we know a third spell at level three but we it's only first level and so then this is going to be level five and seven Nine and eleven. Thirteen and fifteen. And then uh, we finally come to our tenth spell known at level seventeen here. Now, this is, uh, remember, our, our Gloomstalker spells are in addition. They don't count against the ones we know. And what I just demonstrated is if you just take spells as you can get them, there is a way that you can reteach or relearn spells. If this spell here isn't working for you, when you level up, you can instead replace it with another first level spell. Or if you, if you can know third level spells, you can replace this spell with a third level spell. I, I hope that makes sense. It, if you want a, you know, the 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 play by play of that, um, if you come down to uh, the spell casting section, it will spell it out for you. Wah, wah, wah. Uh, I'm, I'm catching up in chat here real quick. Uh, Tackler, you want to name her Vivian? This orc who has taken a more humanistic look feels like a Vivian for a first name. Last name unsure.
<laughs> Fallon, that's some that's some dedication. You're gonna throw every trope at him. That's that's great. I I love that Fallon, and I I hope that he will too. Hark says I really want to play at, an at sea D and D game more than ever now. My hype has finally hit me since now I'm more or less done with being sick. Oh, I'm glad you're feeling better, Hark. I've implemented the smart-ass comment rule. If if one of the kids makes a comment on what they want to do, they have to do it. The party almost died to two nights last night. Uh-oh. Uh, Jensen uh, Zenzana. Vivian Zenzana. There we go. Any tips on any tips on how would you have Strahd basically let my PCs go without making him look weak? My PCs are lost and scared in his castle at level one and have no items. Whew. Um Strahd Alright, if you're playing Strahd for Strahd, Strahd wouldn't let them go. Uh necessarily. At least not from Barovia. That being said. Uh, Strahd might just say, I'll let you go because, frankly, I need more, um, um, I need more, uh, more breeders in Barovia. I need more people to live and to make more babies so that they continue to farm and live off the land and therefore I live off of them. And so if he lets them go, it's because they have just kind of resigned themselves, uh, to live as, uh, farmers and are basically there just to bring in the next generation of people uh, in Barovia so that Strahd can be lord over them. Because what is a vampire if there's no one to uh, rule over or especially to feed from? Uh, Jensen, uh, that link might still have it. Uh, if not, then Jensen, if you join our Discord. I'll bring it up real quick here. If you bring, if you join our Discord. And you go to stream content here. Whenever we make content, uh, content in a workshop, I post it here so that if you liked that content you can download it and modify it or use it however you'd like so for example we made a map download the map you want to see how we made the map watch how the map was made you like the regional map and in, in the society that we made here you could download it and you can watch it do you want our workshop uh, or our worksheet from our workshop on building this desert coastal city it's right here for you to download uh, does this character interest you? Uh, we have a cat, a good female human bard, College of Valor, who's a criminal smuggler. Uh, Maraschino, she likes to make friends, but is very slow to trust. Uh, after learning that adults aren't all kind and generous, she can be quick to strike out and do what is needed to survive and even be more important and wealthy than her mentor, Nala Smithy, who's a character up above. And so if you like this character, you can download her. And of course, you could clear all the entries if you want this sheet in particular. Uh, but you can download any of the characters we made, or if you want to watch them be made, you can watch and you could watch all of these very interesting characters. We do not make boring characters here. They all have compelling reasons to exist, to make decisions. They have a lifestyle. They have uh, preferences and friends or family. Uh, they're not just uh, an elven cleric. And it's left at that. They are all of our characters are much more, and you can find all of that in our stream content. Yeah, Jensen. Hey, we're here as a community. We want to share these ideas. We want to empower more people to step up and play or to step up their game as players. You enjoyed the session? 
Looking forward to the next one. All right, so Tomato, this is the last session of this week. I do not broadcast Sunday nights or Monday nights. When we come back, it will be Tuesday in our Tuesday campaign where you can watch me practice what I preach as I run an ongoing campaign for viewers in the com or, uh, for members of the community. And then the next Wednesday through Saturday, we'll have another workshop series. Bubonic, you're going to get going. All right, see you around. Jensen, you are not hijacking. This is an open discussion forum. I may be presenting a workshop, but by no means is it just me on a soapbox uh, lecturing you. I, I may pretend to be a, like a D&D &D professor, uh, but this is open conversation. If you need help with something that's not related to our workshop, you can always ask. Always ask. <laughs> the game starts the game starts at 11 p.m. Eastern time. And for uh for any of you who want if you want to catch up. Now we do we do a synopsis uh we do a synopsis at the beginning of the session where each character gives uh their their take on what's happening from their own perspective. It's a good way to go from table talk to warming up into role play. However, if you come down here to our Adventure Diaries and the Tuesday Roleplay Campaign 1, you can you can read an abbreviation, a text abbreviation, of the things that have happened. Or you can watch the video of what happened on YouTube. And it's all presented here. That said, if you want to watch uh, or if you want to read what, what's happening in our Tomb of Annihilation open campaign at my store that I run on Thursdays, now, you'll spoil Tomb of Annihilation for yourself, so, I mean, don't do that if you want to play through it, and I recommend you do. But uh, you could read that here, or when I ran Curse of Strahd, uh, down here for my Strahd diary, you can read all of the decisions <laughs> that the party made over the course of many Thursdays uh, at the store as they were going through Curse of Strahd. Qualified D and D professor, uh, that'd be interesting if I if I had that as a title, especially if that was actually a job. Asking about surprise state during a multi attack. Yep, <laughs> uh, I might be able to make it. Tuesday is my game day for as well. Usually finish around eleven. Well, old knock. Uh, we start at eleven, but we have some table talk. Uh, you know, I, I say hi to everyone because I've been gone for two days. And, uh, and then, of course, we start the, the character-by-character character review. So the role-playing starts around 11.30, I'd say. Uh, Fallon, yes, uh, we've had 19 character deaths so far. Guru, referee, handholder, oh, that's lewd. Uh, cat groomer, <laughs> muncher, yes, exactly. Uh, ASMR specialist. Yeah, if you can, old knock, you're welcome. And I do encourage role play in chat also. I read what you all say in chat. And so if you're providing some like background prompts and some other cool stuff, um, I might be able to incorporate it into the game. Um, and th that's you, you don't need to provide a donation or anything for that. However, if any of you do want to step up and be what we call a fickle god, a fickle god, you can do so. And uh, even for just 100 bits or a donation of a dollar, uh, you can influence the game in some way, uh, be it, you know, uh, for or against the party, or to make it fair, for or against me as the DM. So you can impose a disadvantage on me, or, whew. All right, if, all, if you all just have like an hour and a half, if you have an hour and a half, watch the first part of last Tuesday's session. It was session 43 uh, entitled Meat. Watch the first part if you want to see some very good role playing and some very intense moments as well as community interaction.
How many D&D books have we read? That's an interesting equivalent, Ozzy. Many. It's definitely not the Tomb of Pleasant Journeys. And you know what's nice? Uh, Tomb of Annihilation, you can turn into a nautical campaign for the most part. Yeah, for about half of it, anyway. Actually, no. For most of it, you could theoretically be on a boat. Yep, tack uh, Tackler has it, uh, Fallon. All right, well, you know what? We have Vivian Zenzana made up here. Um, I mean, aside from choosing her spells, she is a complete character. She's able to make decisions. We can slip into this character's role and be able to pick up, uh, you know, her nuances, her history, her compelling factors. We know that she has a smug anime face as well. Right? She is a compelling character who isn't just a delivery method for mechanics. Right? For rolling dice and, and, and dealing damage. She has a life. She has hopes and dreams and fears. She has goals. And that's what I love about these workshops is our characters are three-dimensional. And they're wonderful. And they're so organic. Because we grow them from the, round, uh, from the ground up. And we entrust, like, we give up control, which is something a lot of us might have trouble doing in our lives. And it creates a lot of stress. Or it can create a lot of uh, re uh, repetition, which can then lead to, you know, sameness and, and maybe a feeling of things getting dull. And by giving up control, we let the dice handle that. And then we challenged ourselves being thoughtful human beings. How do we connect the dots? How do we circle the square? And we do it every time. And every time we get smarter, we grow more adaptive. We share more stories. And we're better players, dungeon masters, or overall, we're just better human beings for this practice. And I'm honored to spend this time doing that with you all. Does it get a, she would have a proficiency in it if it existed, Fallon. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ozzy, depending, uh, depending on the session, sometimes I'd have 14 or 16 people at the table, and sometimes I'd have six. 